Welcome to Tech Talk. I'm your host, Nadira Nazia. I have the pleasure to welcome back Natalia Kusendova, which is the MPP for Mississauga Center. I have to say, I really admire this woman. The reason being is because she's still doing two jobs. She does a full time and a half job as being the MPP serving the constituency of Mississauga Center. At the same time, she's still doing her shift as a nurse. And that's really great and admirable because she's still keeping up with her accreditation and also she gets to work with the people so that she can understand what are the issues at a grassroots level. Natalia, welcome back. Nadira, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Thank you. It, really good. And I think I've told you that before. It's, not, it's really difficult, the job that you do. is very, very demanding. At the same time, you still keep up. And I think it's really good too because you get to keep up with... What are the issues? What are the people saying? At the same time, that keeps it very grounded and, and, and very real. But what we want to talk about today <laughs> is the budget. Absolutely. And so you've said it so well yourself that, uh, you know, uh, being with my patients uh, really helps to keep me informed about where our healthcare issues lie. And so I do about two shifts per month uh, just to maintain my nursing license. And uh, and I love my, my job as a nurse, but of course I love my job as an MPP. Uh, and that's what people elected me to do. And I'm just so um, humbled to be able to serve the people of Ontario. And you get to serve them two ways. In the hospital, and also as an MPP. Exactly. Best of both worlds. Yes. <laughs> so we want to talk about the budget today. Thank you so much for coming very well prepared. Um, so there's a lot of people who normally approach me and say, hey, they have certain questions. As you know, I am running federally for Beatrice East yes. York. Uh, oftentimes, people doesn't know the differences come down between a federal level and a provincial level. But we I welcome all these questions because now I have that opportunity to ask you those answers at the provincial level about what's being done. First of all, maybe just a quick general questions regarding the budget for this year. What strategy does the government plan on using to reduce the deficit towards a big goal? In, uh, because that's one of the things that they said that they were going to do once they got into power is to reduce the deficit. What are they doing to do that? Absolutely. So I am just so proud of this budget and the title of the budget is protecting what matters the most. And this is the first conservative budget in the province of Ontario and uh, since the last 15 years. And, you know, this uh, budget outlines a responsible plan to return to balance because you know what? Budgets do not balance themselves. And therefore, we, we really laid out the plan for the people of Ontario to understand how we're going to return to balance by year 2023 to uh, 2024. Uh, and this plan is laid out with no new tax increases. You know, when we were running, we committed to the people of Ontario that we will not be increasing our taxes because we already pay so many taxes in this province. And so, you know, our budget outlines that plan. And just to highlight some of the key things that are in this budget, for example, we're bringing $26 billion over the next six years in relief to Ontario families, individuals and, biz and businesses as well, while at the same time eliminating the deficit. So elim eliminating the deficit is not an easy process. When we started this task, we were at a $15 billion deficit. The previous Liberal government has left us with $15 billion of deficit, even though the Premier the previous Premier Kathleen Wynne uh, promised the people of Ontario that she will c come back to balance by the end of the, her term in year 2018 and she has not done that. She has left us in a 15 billion dollar deficit but our government with our Premier Doug Ford and of course our Minister of Finance Vic Fideli already in the first nine months that we were in power we were able to reduce the deficit to 11.7 uh, billion dollars so that's almost four, four billion of savings that we found just by looking for efficiencies within the way the government spent. So for example, getting rid of fax machines, right? That's such an archaic way of doing things. Nobody uses faxes anymore. So we got rid of fax machines. What else did we eliminate? For example, some um, governmental publications get, get printed thousands of copies of, of, you know, these brochures that lay and then collect dust. We live in a digital era. So instead of printing all of this, um, these materials, they are available on our websites. People of Ontario can access digital copies, which is what they do anyways, right? And so by just looking at these little things here and there in every single ministry, going through line by line in every single ministry, we already found 
such a significant saving in just the first nine months. And this budget really lays out a plan over in the next five years how we will slowly but responsibly return to balance while protecting what matters the most, such as you know education and health care. And, and we're going to get into those questions. I know it's not an easy task to clean up after a liberal government and to be able to reduce deficit. You and I know that. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And also there's a lot of misconception out there. And, and really today's show is about addressing those misconceptions, right? And I know we may not cover everything in the 25 minutes of this show, but certainly there will be information available for them to see online from your mm -hmm. website or other website that you may mention as to where people can go and be better informed about what the budget's are about and where the cuts mm -hmm. are and the reason behind it. So um, I have a few questions for you. The first one is about education. Every parent out there wants a, a very good publicly funded education for their kids, right? So what is being done by the Ontario education system to keep up to date? So that's a great question. I mean, children are our future. Mm -hmm. So making investments into our kids and their education matters to every Ontarian, whether they have kids or not, we want to make sure that the next generation is, is well equipped because they are the leaders of tomorrow. And so um, in our budget, we have actually increased education spending. Despite what, what is being uh, told out there, uh, the overall spending from previous year is going up by 700 million. Now within certain uh, school boards, yes, there are some very modest cuts, but they're so modest. And let me explain. Um, so th the funding for schools is based on student enrollment. And so if in certain areas in, in the province, for example, in Toronto, uh, there's less and less students because young families cannot afford to live in Toronto. So they're moving out more into my area, Mississauga or Hamilton, or more to the west because Toronto is so expensive. So uh, because the student enrollment is decreasing in Toronto, some of the Toronto school boards, unfortunately, have been hit by some cuts. But those cuts are very modest. When we actually look, zoom in, zone, zone in on the numbers, it's, it's less, it's usually one to 2% from the overall school, uh, school board budget. So, you know, the misinformation that's out there that, for example, in Mississauga, 400 teachers are being laid off, that is factually incorrect. In Mississauga, just so you know, mm -hmm. it's my writing that I represent, we have four school boards. Out of the four school boards, three of them are getting a modest increase of about 1% one, uh, 1 or 1.5%. 1 Only one school board, which is the Catholic school board, is having a decrease of 0 0.9 percent, just less than a 1 percent decrease. And why? Because there is decreased enrollment in a Catholic school board. And those are the, the facts, those are the numbers. But even so, it's a huge school board, right? So the Catholic uh, school board, um, that they have almost a billion, one billion dollar budget overall. So the 1 percent decrease is about eight million dollars. But in the eight million dollars is spread out through 150 schools. So if we divide 8 million by 150 schools, each school has a decrease of $53,000. So when we really look at the numbers, people cannot tell me that be, by decreasing the funding by $53,000 per school, we will be firing 400 teachers. That is factually incorrect. And I, and, and I just want to assure the parents that 400 teachers will not be losing their jobs in Mississauga. It's just, it's just unfortunate, right? Because you see a lot of people kind of protesting regarding that, which is unnecessary. So it's a really matter of educating them. Because at the end of the day, both the student and the teachers wants to know what the Ontario government are doing to protect them, right? Because when you just run the numbers, it's 53,000 per year for one school. It's, it's less than one, like it's probably half of a salary of one teacher. So numbers speak for themselves. And so, you know, when people really want information, they really should look at the, the numbers and at the budget. And the budget was only re released last Friday for the school board. So I'm not sure why school boards were already issuing these redundancy notices to teachers and sort of fueling a little bit of this panic and this scare. But I've already been receiving phone calls from some teachers that have been uh, their, redundant, their redundancy notice has been recalled and they have assurances that they will be hired uh, when September is coming. They will be still returning back to school. So that, that's the process right now. School boards are really looking at their numbers, their budgets, they're analyzing their human resources. And most of those uh, uh, redundancy notices that were issued to teachers will now be recalled. For all the teachers and students that are listening out there and the parents, well, here you go. This is the answer. 
Thank you for that education. <laughs> You're welcome. And I do have one more question about education, sure. and then we're going to take a quick break. It's regarding the math score. It's been mm -hmm. declining year over year. Uh, what is the Ontario government doing mm -hmm. about that? So it is very unfortunate because, um, you know, spending on teachers in our schools have been increasing under the previous government, which is good. We need to invest in our teachers. However, um, math scores have been consistently decreasing and we are one of the lowest provinces when it comes to EQAO testing and when it comes to our math scores and literacy scores. And so the Discovery Math program uh, that the previous government endorsed is not working. So we scrapped that and we have a new math strategy that we're going to be rolling out over the next uh, four years. But we really need to focus on those fundamentals because if students cannot do simple multiplication, you know, that is very alarming because the future is in math, in engineering, you know, all the STEM. That's the future. That's where we really need to be investing. And that's why we are also introducing a mandatory test for teachers that they have to, um, all, all teachers in Ontario will, be have, will have to pass a test that is basically a grade six level. Um, th that all teachers are required to have a grade six level math competency. I don't think that's asking, to be honest, for too much of our teachers, even if they teach various subjects, to be able to do grade six level math. And so I hope that teachers <laughs> welcome that because that, you know, that, that's important that we, we have teachers that have the skills to teach our, our, our kids, especially math. Absolutely, and I think because of technology. Nowadays, everybody has a smartphone and they just use a calculator on it. They're not using their brain and, and simply because, and I know technology is becoming an issue with the way that it's being used all the time. It's holding us back in our lifestyle. Mm -hmm. We don't have that connection anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's sadly also spilling over from the way that kids are learning because they're so dependent on that technology, even just to do simple math instead of using their brain. Mm -hmm. Oh, let me use the calculator. Exactly. So we need to return to those fundamentals. But one of the things that we we're also doing in our classrooms is we, we ban cell phones. I mean, I think it's I'm all for that. Honestly, I think it's not rocket science to know that cell phones are distracting. They're distracting for us adults, let alone for for students. You know, when I was in high school and that wasn't that long ago, uh, phones were not allowed. If I had a phone, it would be f co confiscated by the teachers, even if it was in the hallway, let alone in a classroom. So meanwhile, for some students with special needs, a, um, a cell phone can be a good learning tool. And in those circumstances, uh, teachers are more than welcome to, to allow those students that have those special needs to have the, the, the phones uh, on them in the classroom. But in general, we are banning cell phones in the classroom because our kids are distracted and they're, in, they're texting, they're, they're going on Instagram instead of listening to the teachers. So this is part of our strategy to make sure we return to fundamentals and we're, we're preparing our kids for the jobs that exist, but we give them the tools that they need uh, to succeed. And also show them how to be focused because there's a focus issue, right? Because you're so distracting, they're trying to multitask. They can't really focus on the task at hand. I'm in agreement about that. Even for us adults, we need to take a break sometimes from our cell phone. It's healthy to take a break from the technology. On that note, we're going to take a quick break and be right back with Natalia Kusandova, MPP for Mississauga Center. <music> Combine a love and passion for food with authentic Mediterranean flavors. Add a touch of warmth and relaxation, and you'll have the best dining experience at Alpha Wall Restaurant. Located in the heart of Mississauga at 2273 Dundas Street West. Bring your loved ones and reward your appetite to an exquisite halal prepared menu. Our secret ingredient is just a hinge of love. Each plate prepared with care, creating a universal piece of art. Make every bite a memorable moment with All For All Restaurant. Welcome back, everybody. We are here today with our special guest, Natalia Kusandova, MPP for Mississauga Center, talking about the Ontario budget. Uh, the reason why we're talking about the Ontario budget is because there's a lot of misconception about what it is, a lot of misunderstanding. So Natalia is here today to kind of clarify some of the key misconception of what people think it is, but it's really not. So thank you for that. Uh, next is healthcare. Uh, the question that I guess I have for you, what is the government doing to transform healthcare? Wow, that's a loaded question because yeah. we're doing a lot. <laughs> so 
In this particular budget, some of the highlights. Um, so we're investing 2% uh, overall. Um, so the budget is uh, for healthcare spending is increasing by 2% from the previous year. So there is no cut overall, there's actually an increase. Let me say that again, there is no cut overall, there is an actual increase. And for this year, 2019-2020, uh, uh, there is an investment of $384 million uh, uh, to build capacity within our hospitals um, to open up more beds. But also, we're investing in, over the next 10 years, $17 billion in capital and infrastructure grants uh, to um, re renovate some of our hospitals because they're old and they, they, they need to be renovated, but also to, to build some new spaces. Uh, other things that we're doing, we're investing $267 million in home and community care funding. So because we want to make sure that our seniors and people are comfortable uh, living as long as they can in their homes because we know that patient outcomes are much better when patients are supported in their own spaces. Nobody wants to be institutionalized. Nobody likes being in the hospital. So if they don't have to be, we would prefer for them to actually stay in their home. And how do we achieve that? By providing the right supports, by providing PSWs, registered nurses, physio, all these healthcare professionals, they can come and do the home care services that patients require. Another one that I'm really excited about, because this is a new initiative, is $90 million this year for low-income seniors uh, to be able to access dental care. So we know that in Ontario, uh, two out of three, so two-thirds of seniors actually do not have access to any dental insurance. And, you know, those dental services are very expensive. And for seniors on a fixed income, some of them simply cannot afford to go see their dentist. So, you know, I work in the emergency room and as a nurse, I see these seniors coming in when things get so bad to the point that they need to seek medical intervention. Um, and so, but we, we can't fix their abscesses. We can't do those things in the emergency room. All we can do is give them pain medication and we can give them um, antibiotics if an infection sets in and then they go back out with no access to dental care. So by investing this $90 million for low-income seniors, we're hoping to alleviate, alleviate some of these emergency room visits, which will also help us end hallway medicine. So all of the things that we're doing here, you know, we have a strategy how to end hallway medicine in Ontario. That was one of our campaign promises and it remains a steadfast priority for this government to eliminate hallway medicine in Ontario. Other investments that we've talked about many times, mental health and addictions. We know we have a rising opioid crisis in Ontario. We know we have a mental health crisis. We don't have enough mental health providers in Ontario. Um, and again, those patients end up in our emergency rooms. Well, mental health patients could be taken care of much of more effectively and appropriately in the community by building spaces uh, such as urgent care centers for mental health issues. And so we are developing uh, an overarching mental health strategy and this year alone we're investing 174 million dollars into that. Which is much needed because the statistics shows one out of three people suffer from mental illness and that could vary as well too, right? Absolutely, you know, mental health is not talked about enough and it still remains a stigma, but we're hoping to change the dialogue. That's why, you know, Bell Let's Talk yes. Day is so important. And that's why, you know, our minister, Lisa McLeod, she came out a few years ago and talked about her own mental health struggles because you know what? It affects people from all walks of life, all religions, all, uh, you know, racial communities and all professions. Like, you know, even in our jobs as MPPs, there's a lot of stress involved. And so being able to talk about it, I think is step number one to addressing the stigma. And then while well, we also need to create services for people because it's not enough to just talk about it. Now, where do we go to seek the help? So we do need to create a, a mental health strategy. We need to normalize it. I think right now it's embarrassing when somebody say they have a mental illness, they think of it as a bad thing. It's not. It's actually healthy to talk about it. It needs to be a normal conversation, just like we talk about exercise and mm -hmm. dieting. There you go. But even in my own profession as a nurse and, you know, paramedics, we as healthcare professionals, we know when we're starting to get into those mental health issues, but it's stigmatized even among us. So it's actually an interesting trend that mental health providers do not feel comfortable going out there and seeking out services to help them for, with their mental health struggles. It's very interesting because we know the symptoms, we know the signs, yet we 
we are afraid of the stigma, so we don't go and we don't get the help. So anyway, it, it's a societal issue. It's not just an Ontario Correct. issue, but we're, we need to do something to address it. So that's why you know we have committed to $1.9 billion over the next uh, five years. And this year alone, we're investing $174 million uh, into mental health and addictions. So overall for the health budget, what do you think is a misconception on that? What are you hearing from people, from your constituents that is untrue? So, you know, so mental, uh, so health, there, <laughs> healthcare is just so complex and there are so many different stakeholders involved, right? We also have a public health piece. So there's been a lot of talk about public health funding, especially in the city of Toronto. I just wanted to put it out there, you know, there is more to Ontario than just the city of Toronto. Sometimes I feel like the city of Toronto gets all the attention and but there's also the rest of us out there like, like Mississauga, like Mississauga <laughs> that you know doesn't get talked about as much so um, yeah. you know what's been in the news is that we are decreasing uh, public health funding yes we are modestly decreasing the funding because we are um, so there right now there are 34 public health units across Ontario but we're merging them into 10 because we want them to be more efficient and more effective and also be able to recruit uh, you know um, professionals because some of the smaller public health units in northern Ontario for example they have trouble actually hiring nurses because they're so small so we want to um, you know streamline things and make things more efficient so we're transforming from 34 uh, public health units across Ontario into about 10 and due to efficiencies and this will result in in these um, efficiencies but overall um, the public health spending for this year we're, we're decreasing by 200 million when we spread that across uh, you know 10 units, it's actually not such a huge significant number. And the number for the Toronto Public Health Unit, the change that we're um, implementing, it's actually 0.3 percent, one third of a percent change of the City of Toronto's overall budget. So it's really a tiny drop in the bucket that we're decreasing the funding. Um, so it's not 10 billion or 1 billion, whatever the councillor Joe Cressy has been saying, that number is incorrect. Uh, it is not one billion dollars okay and so you know we remain committed to pub, uh, to funding public health but we re recognize that municipalities have to do their part and also in the cost sharing of this and they have done that historically uh, but they have to continue sharing in the cost and our government will continue to do our part because we need to fund vaccinations we need to fund you know sexual health clinics uh, mother baby clinics for breastfeeding all of these things are very important. Public health units are protecting Ontarians and we recognize that and, and this work will continue. Yes, there will be some small changes and some small efficiencies, but it is nowhere near to the, to the size of $1 billion. So you've given out a lot of great information here. Where can somebody find it in very bullet points, right? Boom, 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 here's the information. So if you want, uh, you can always request a copy of our budget. It's available, um, but, but it's basically on the government website, ontario.ca slash budget. You can find all the information about all the different sectors and how it's being spent. Okay. So going back to the theme that I mentioned earlier at the top of the show, it's about an education. It's really about educating yourself about what the Ontario budget entails instead of the rumors and misconception out there. So the information is available on the website for you to educate yourself on it. So we're gonna take a quick break and then we'll be right back. Combine a love and passion for food with authentic Mediterranean flavors. Add a touch of warmth and relaxation and you'll have the best dining experience at Alpha Wall Restaurant. Located in the heart of Mississauga at 2273 Dundas Street West. Bring your loved ones and reward your appetite to an exquisite halal prepared menu. Our secret ingredient is just a hinge of love. Each plate prepared with care, creating a universal piece of art. Make every bite a memorable moment with All For All Restaurant. Welcome back, everybody, to Education 101 of the Ontario Budget with Natalia <laughs> Kusendova. Question for you about mm -hmm. the healthcare. What is that transformation process? What does that transformation look like? So our Minister of Health uh, and Long-Term Care, Christine Elliott, uh, has recently uh, introduced and passed um, Bill 74, 
the People's Health Care Act. And I was so lucky to be on that committee because I loved working on that bill. That bill really lays out the plan of how we're going to transform our health care. Because right now our health care is fragmented. It's not working. Hallway medicine is alive and well in Ontario. I know because I work those shifts. I work those shifts in the hallway for 12, 13 hours taking care of bedridden patients that really should be in a room. But because there are no beds available, they end up in a hallway. Uh, you know, we have long wait times to see a specialist or to even see a physician in the emergency room. So our plan uh, in Bill 74, the People's Health Care Act, really lays out the framework of how we're going to do it. So just really quickly, because there's a lot in there, but what we've done with this bill, um, so we have merged the 14 local health integrated net networks, which existed uh, into one. Because what we found with the four 14 LINs, as we call them, they did not work properly because they fragmented our healthcare because each one of them had their own um, uh, their own standards. So, for example, depending on where, where a patient lived in Ontario, one patient would get five hours of care uh, through home care through the CCAC, and if the, that patient lived another patient lived across the street in another boundary, they would get seven hours. So it wasn't standardized and it wasn't equitable. So, and also the bureaucracy in these LINs, they actually cost taxpayers a lot of money. And so we've merged uh, those 14 uh, local integrated health networks, plus uh, six other government agencies such as Cancer Care Ontario, Trillium Gift of Life, into one. And this, um, this new agency is called Ontario Health, and it is one place for, you know, for funding, transparency, and accountability. Instead of having 14, or, uh, plus six, so 20 different agencies, we have one. So we're streamlining everything. But also we're introducing, you know, KPIs, making sure that um, the funding that we're spending in healthcare actually produces the results and we're measuring those results, right? We're not just throwing money, we're measuring the results. Well, it's great that the government is having their own scorecard. It, yeah, it's, fantastic it's very to have important. Yes, absolutely. And you know, and just as a curiosity, did you know that in in the Ministry of Health there is something like four thousand transfer payments? You know, that's a lot of bureaucracy that does not need to happen. And each one of the lens had their own leases. You know, we need to streamline things, and this is the role of government that needs to play. So by merging into this one Ontario Health, we have one place for funding, transparency, accountability. But through, through Ontario Health, we are introducing what is called Ontario Health Teams. And these Ontario Health Teams, there will be between uh, 30 to 50 in Ontario. Uh, they will be local teams that will form. Uh, that will, um, so they will basically involve primary care, um, long-term care, home care, uh, mental health care, and any other services. It'll be like a bundle of services, one-stop shop. So these teams will be responsible for their patient 24-7. So it's not like now you go to your family doctor at 5 o'clock, see ya, you can't, you can't see anyone. No, they will be available to the patient 24-7. And more importantly, they will be, the same team will be responsible for the patient regardless if they're at home, like t get, taking, uh, getting home care, or if they are in a hospital, or if they are in long-term care, it's the same team. So the same team follows you no matter where you are. So your care is not centered around the brick and mortar where you happen to be. It's really truly centered around you. Because our patients were frustrated. Every time they go to a new healthcare provider, they have to start their story from scratch. They mm -hmm. have to repeat 10,000 times to each healthcare provider. Now it's going to be one team responsible for you no matter where you go. Another part, we're introducing electronic health record. I mean, this should be a no-brainer that in this day and age we should have a seamless electronic uh, patient record so that again doctors can seamlessly log into a portal and see your information so if you're in the emergency room you can see the information from the family doctor it, it's such a no-brainer right and it will actually reduce the cost because we will not need to be doubling the tests the doctors will see the diagnostics from last week if the patient already had their blood work done they will check the scores, they will check the numbers, and maybe not have to do it again. But right now, we don't have that. So emergency room physicians have to order everything. They order blood work, they order diagnostics. These are real tangible cost savings that, that we can have. And also, it's just great to have an electronic patient record that patients will be able to access. What a revolutionary idea that you can actually Welcome access Welcome to 2019, technology, the so, era of technology. It's actually really great because at the end of the day, 
everybody has a smartphone. And would patients be able eventually to have some certain level of access to their information as well too? So that is the plan for patients to be able to access and own their electronic uh, health record without having to pay $20 fee to their family physician or whatever fee to the hospitals. This is the, the idea that patients are empowered to have their um, you know, healthcare information. Absolutely. So I'm just so excited about this bill um, and um, you know, you know, it will take time because changes don't happen overnight. Absolutely. But within Especially. this next four years and within our government's mandate, I think we're going to transform our healthcare system. And I'm just so proud of our minister, Elliot, and of the entire team that's been working on this. And now that the bill has passed and received the royal assent, the real word work begins, right? So I'm just so excited for that. Absolutely, and I can see your excitement. So there's a lot of great things to look forward to, especially me coming from corporate <coughs> IT. I'm all about standardization, efficiency, and mm -hmm. use the use of technology. I don't think we're using it enough, especially within the government, but it's time that we kind of up that game because everybody today are very techno savvy and it's good to be able to have your information at a fingertip. Absolutely, and just final point on technology, we are working on a telehealth project where uh, for certain um, ailments, patients will be able to access the doctor via like a, tele, a teleconference instead of actually having to physically go in. Obviously, it does, cannot work for everything because for some things, your doctor actually has to touch you and assess you, but for, for certain ailments, I think it's uh, it's very revolutionary, and I know in other provinces, for example, dermatologists, because that's a very visual yes. type of field, dermatologists are already using it. So let's empower people. Let's use technology. Technology is our friend, and I'm just so, so that's excited. So that's a video conference. Exactly. So to be able to access your healthcare Excellent. provider via video instead of going into the emergency room, waiting forever. You know, so this is this is great news and it's very exciting. It is really great mm -hmm. news. And I, I just learned quite a bit of things from you too. So thank you for that. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, I want to touch on transportation. What is being done regarding transportation specifically for Mississauga? So in Mississauga, great news. Uh, we ha are funding the Here Ontario LRT. So uh, this was uh, a previous government's um, sort of idea and project, but we did do our due diligence. We did review uh, the numbers um, and we have some minor changes. For example, we got rid of the loop around square one because that cost $300 million. Let me say that again. The loop around square one cost $300 million. And uh, a lot of stakeholders, a lot of people were wondering what's the point of having the loop uh, because uh, the way it was planned, um, you would, okay, the Huron Interior LRT, basically, just to explain, it connects Brampton, and uh, so, so it starts in Brampton, goes through Mississauga, it's about 22 kilometers of the li light rail transit, um, and so anyway, so people would have to get off at, uh, around the loop, which is beside the city hall, and then get back on, so it wasn't a seamless trip. And a lot of people are wondering why. And so um, we did our due diligence, we consulted, uh, we'll, we crunched the numbers again, and we got rid of the loop. So now it's one seamless ride from, from Brampton all the way down to Lakeshore. Uh, so that's a great investment into Mississauga, uh, $1.4 billion that uh, our government is investing. And you know, the, the point is to decrease congestion, uh, to make our city more walkable, more breathable, so to encourage people to not use their cars, but get on the LRT to get to work. Will everyone be able to use it? No, because not everyone lives in the confinements of the LRT, but we're hoping to, uh, to encourage uh, the usage as much as possible for those who, uh, that will actually um, be able to get to work that way. But what, what is really good about this is that it connects uh, the Brampton Sheridan College campus to the Mississauga Sheridan College campus, and we know that students are uh, some of the most frequent users of public transit, so, so I'm really excited that we're doing that. Other What's the time frame for that? So you know what, shovels should go in very soon. I keep asking the minister <laughs> and he's, he doesn't want to give me a straight answer because once he knows, once he tells me, then he's committed. But um, it, it, the shovels will be going in pretty soon. Uh, right now we're, we're still at the stage of requ request for proposals. There are three consortiums of companies that haven't approved uh, to bid. And from what I understand, they're uh, preparing their bids and submitting their bids right now. And then from the three consortium, we will pick, uh, not us, but Metrolinx, who is our governmental mm -hmm. agency, will pick one of the consortia to actually start the construction work um, and the design and everything on, on the project. So this construction will take the four years of my mandate. So I know people will be frustrated during construction. Usually people, you yeah. know, because uh, there will be more traffic, et cetera. 
but good thing six times. So be patient. Exactly. <laughs> so so I'm excited that over the next four years we will be really building this, and hopefully by the time we're done, um, you know, we will still be in government. I'm pretty sure we will. Pretty confident you will be. I am. Yes, yeah, because <laughs> you guys are doing some really amazing job. Thank and you. I know I have one last question this is regarding childcare. Mm -hmm. Young families out there, what can they expect regarding <clears throat> childcare from the Ontario government? So I'm really excited about this. Uh, you know, we are investing $1 billion to create 30,000 childcare spaces. We know childcare is something that all families struggle with, not only funding it, but also finding the spaces. We don't, we simply do not have enough childcare spaces in Ontario right now. And so out of the 30,000, about 10,000 are in new schools. So completely brand new schools, which we're, we're looking to invest in and to build. Uh, but we're also introduced something called the child care credit. And this is really exciting because this is a credit that uh, parents can apply for in their taxes. It's called child care access and relief from expenses care. And it's effective starting January 1st of this year. So they'll be, parents will be able to file it under their next tax return. And basically, um, uh, you will get a credit of up to $6,000 for a child under seven years old, and then uh, $3,750 for a child between uh, seven to 16 years old. And then for children with disability, we're increasing the credit up to $8,250. But the good thing about this program is that parents get to choose the daycare. So it can be publicly funded, it can be privately funded, it can be uh, used for, for example, t hockey lessons, or it can be used to pay for um, summer camp. So we're really giving the choice to the parents, and we're not, you know, telling them, we, they know best what's for their child. So we're, we're not telling them where to spend the money, we're giving them carte blanche to spend money on services that will benefit their kids. And, um, and yeah, so this is great news for Ontario families and one that I'm very excited about. And especially we need to build those childcare spaces. I don't have kids yet, but I'm planning to have kids one day and I need some spaces. So Absolutely. I'm happy that we're doing this. Absolutely. <laughs> Any last thing you want to tell the viewers and your constituents here before we end the show? Well, I just wanted to say thank you once again, you know, for giving me the honor to serve you. Uh, I'm here to learn and listen. Nobody is born an MPP, and I've learned so much in the last nine months. It's been an incredible journey so far. Um, of course, every day is different. Every day um, we have different challenges. Even today, I had a constituent in my office uh, that has a quite difficult situation. But every time I try to do my best to address those issues and connect people to the ministries that are responsible. And so, you know, what I wanted to tell my constituents and, and the viewers today is, you know, to give our government the benefit of doubt. I know there's a lot of negative attention perpetrated by certain channels, the certain media, um, because, you know, good news doesn't sell, bad news sells, right? But uh, give us the benefit of doubt. Give us a little bit more time to actually, the changes that we're bringing to Ontario to actually take effect, because this is just our first budget and it was just introduced literally a couple of weeks ago. So for those changes and the investments that we're making to actually uh, take effect will take a little bit of time. Absolutely, if you have questions, please reach out, inform yourself. Don't just, whatever you hear in the media, don't just take that at face value. Do your own research, educate yourself because knowledge is power, right? And even though, yes, there are some modest, small cuts in, in these budgets because we want to return back to balance, the overall spending overall is actually increasing. So please get informed, look at, look at the numbers, and if you have any doubts, reach out to your MPP. Well, Natalia, thank you so much. I think this is a great show today. It's about Ontario Budget Education 101. So we've covered quite a bit at a very high level. For more details, contact your MPP, or you can also check it out on the website. Absolutely appreciate your time, and I think the way that you laid it out, it's actually a great budget that will absolutely help people of Ontario. And please, like, uh, just to reiterate what Natalia said, educate yourself on this budget. Be informed. Ask the questions instead of just assuming of what it is. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Knowledge is power. Yes, mm -hmm. for that. I'm going to give her a high <laughs> five for this. <laughs> So thank you everybody for joining us today. I want to thank my fashion stylist Susie Tamasi. Her website is susiequewels.com and a portion of her proceeds goes to the woman shelter. And also my wonderful makeup artist Smiley. Thank you so much for the wonderful work today. And please do follow me on Instagram, subscribe to Tag TV, and until next time, stay positive and start believing.